Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn and I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. So um, information resources activities for people who work across the globe in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing and so on. Um, what I do um, is run part of what I do is run these webinars. They're, it's great fun and, and, and it's great to have the ability to talk with people across the world. And we've got a quite a large um, international audience today. We've got hundreds of you signed in, which is great to see. Um, and we're going to be talking about the um, how we're using uh, chat GPT and generative AI and so on in and around medcoms. And just a little bit of context here very briefly. Um, literally just one year ago, this panel convened. Um, we'd got, or certainly I got a bit excited over the Christmas period a year ago, um, ChatGPT was suddenly being talked about, um, didn't know what the heck was going on, and I and, and we as a panel convened just for a bit of fun to have a chat about what might be coming, what might, might be able to do with it, um, and that video recording is available on Network Pharma TV, um, and I thought it'd be quite fun one year on, after all the excitement of the last year, to get the same panel back again to hear what they've been doing for the last year and to throw some ideas around as to how some of these tools are being used in practice. Um, I'm particularly keen from the audience point of view to get your input, your questions, your ideas and your experiences as well. We've got 45 minutes, this isn't enough time. Um, so we're just gonna cover a lot of ground very quickly, I think, and it might get a little bit bonkers, um, but it hopefully will be a bit of fun and provide some food for thought. Right, on that note, I'm gonna ask each of them to um, introduce themselves and say a little bit about what you've been doing for the last 12 months, guys, okay? And Martin, I'm gonna ask you to start, so over to you. Thank you, Peter, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, and, and thanks again, Peter, for, for organizing this uh, second event, uh, which I'm sure will become an annual event, but it's, it's, it is uh, daunting to think that it's just been a year since uh, we presented this. Um, so my name is Martin Delahanty, I'm a, a publishing consultant. I work across a whole range of stakeholders within publishing and science communications. And uh, no surprise, the last 12 months have been dominated by AI and machine learning. And um, I've made some notes just reflecting on, on the last, last 12 months. And, you know, it's, it's nice to see that this this particular event, I think it was one of the first events that I participated in, uh, was referenced by the American Medical Writers Association. So well, well done, Peter, on that. That's in their blog in September. Um, uh, but I think what we have seen uh, over the last 12 months is a, a coming together of everybody within medical communications and medical writing to try and work together to address the challenges and the opportunities around generative AI. So we have seen uh, ISMAP, ISMAP uh, developing a task force and a position statement. And uh, I know Matt Luce is on the on the uh, the call here today. So we'll probably get some input from him, hopefully. Uh, so they've they've got a you know, a task force in place doing lots of activities around education, a position statement. I'm involved with the European Medical Writers Association um, uh, special interest group on medcoms, and we've developed a AI working group, no surpri surprise there. So I'm working with our uh, present elect, uh, Sarah Tilly, uh, Namrata Singh, uh, Slavka Barnakova, and we're putting together educational activities. Uh, we actually have a, a seminar at the May conference in Valence, Valencia coming up on the 9th of May. So a little uh, uh, pr promotion there for that event. Um, and you know, from, from my work perspective, I have been supporting agencies and publishers to try and to get their heads around generative AI and how to manage that. And I think rather than approaching the 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 technologies and you know all the great things that potentially that they they can do, uh, I'm more focused on the the governance, establishing guidelines, uh, SOPs, and also thinking about the 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 risk management of these tools within organisations. Uh, and on the publishers' side, also we're seeing great coming together and collaborations, uh, which I think has been ne necessitated by the perceived challenges to uh, to the publishing industry, scholarly publishing around AI. Uh, so we have, for example, the SEM Association have uh, developed uh, a number of working groups and they've um, 
published a, a, an excellent white paper just before Christmas on on generative AI. Um, so lots has has happened in an incredibly short period of time, which makes me slightly concerned about the next 12 months and, and what's going right. to happen there. <laughs> but uh, we okay. won't crack it all today, but I'll leave it there, Peter, and I'll hand over. I'll, I'll, that's fantastic, Martin. Thanks. Um, and um, and as you say, we won't crack anything today, but it'd be fun to, to skirt over all these issues and some of the ideas are out there and importantly, point people in directions. So you've mentioned ISMAP, you've mentioned EMWA. Let's just use this as an opportunity to mention the fact there's also position statements out from MAPS, um, from HCA, um, the likes of ICMJE. You know, it was it's, it was quite interesting reflecting back on a year ago when we were saying what's going to happen. And it took a few months, but then, boy, did some people start motoring and position statements coming out, seminars, activity and so on and so forth. But I think it's important people in and around this business, uh, we should name check those various organisations that are doing activities there. And um, just the point as we go on to the other introductions, we've got a very eclectic. And that's the point of it, panel here. And I think this is really quite interesting. Each of you, I could spend the next hour with talking about your own areas. But one of the interesting things about this discussion is the sort of the fact that we've got such different perceptions. I hope that's going to come out. Um, so um, um, thank you, Martin and Katia, again. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to for the last 12 months. Okay, I'm Katja Martin from MedTechSpert, and uh, I would like to add a personal perspective to the whole discussion today. Um, um, a lot has happened since we last met or since the appearance of JGPD and brothers and sisters. Acceptance has definitely uh, grown, although I think it started off very slowly. People were a bit hesitant because didn't know what to expect and so on. However, I think uh, from my own experience, um, the systems in general or applications, they really became more performant and that's not just due to better training data. With each release, the algorithm improved, um, models were combined and there's an ongoing fine tuning which you can basically feel with every release. For, or for other Gen AI applications, of course, competition is fierce. So lots of uh, applications from all the important uh, competitors have been released. Um, for instance, what is uh, relevant for me, available options for AI-assisted literature search and handling, they are more or less um, equally performant and of course it depends on your personal preference. I prefer lipmaps. I use PaperPal for instance, but I also have a Grammarly uh, subscription, which is often uh, sub sufficient for my needs. So all I want to say is that basically no matter how many applications come out and so on and so on, at the end you won't have time to try them all out or follow them all up. At the end you have to make a decision and use whatever um, you feel most comfortable with because otherwise it's just going to eat up uh, your time and actually after the first wave of big enthusiasm, I um, I didn't use JetGPD and Co anymore because I realized that I was actually spending more time in getting not just the prompting, but everything right and combining all in and outputs. So writing from scratch still um, was much faster, but because I'm fascinated, I kept trying. So that was the very personal perspective. I've been also uh, involved in helping Emwa put something or contributing to Emwa with an article in the latest issue about AI machine learning and the webinar in December. So uh, that was a lot of fun to try to uh, not promote as I got uh, as a feedback, but to keep everyone aware and open-minded and to encourage people to use it. Of course, always within um, data governments and ethical use standards. 
Okay, thanks, Katia. I, I mean, and I do. Re- I mean, I do remember uh, a few months ago talking to you, and you were sort of going, "This is getting ridiculous. I'm spending all my time on." on this and I'm going to stop doing it sort of thing. I mean, an important point that you made in one of the webinars a few months ago and, and you were making there is there's just a lot, a lot of tools out there and a lot of activity. Um, nobody can really keep up with it all individually. Um, and the, so the problem is picking and choosing what you do. And I think big companies are doing a lot to experiment and there's departments in some of the medcoms agencies now, there are departments, let alone individuals. And some of the pharma companies and all this, but there's, there's a lot of activity going on. One of the things that I'm very aware of is that, you know, um, as an individual outside of anything like that, it's very difficult to know, quite know what's going on. And just as a just as an, a, a, an, an aside, um, we're currently running a, a big, uh, it's turning to quite a big survey of freelancers across the world who work in and around medcoms. And a good third of them are saying we haven't touched um, chat gpt or those sorts of um uh tools um some of them are saying they're using it. a lot of a lot of them are saying we just don't know quite what to do or how to do or how to learn and so on and so forth so there's a big big op- opportunity or gap or problem there i think within the big companies it's easy to think well this is interesting and we'll do our but outside there's a, it's a big big problem as to know quite what to do and how to do it and hopefully these sorts of webinars throw ideas out and help people a little bit um steve just to come on to you well bring you in steve tell us what you've been doing because you're you are coming at things a little bit differently um tell us what you've been doing now you're on mute mate yeah i know i always criticize <laughs> other people for not noticing okay so uh, my name's steve mott i'm uh founder of a company called Farm Advisor, And for the last year, I've stopped doing anything other than AI and um, applications for it within the, particularly the medical affairs arena. Um, so what I just, a few couple of quick points. The, what is clear is that the same caution is being applied to AI by the industry, as we saw with the internet, you know, uh, two decades ago, and now look at it. So we're on a trajectory, I believe, where there's an inevitability that um, AI tools will become a dominant feature of our, our work workplace. Um, the IMF has just published in from, I think, from Davos, have said, speakers have said that uh, this, I think this industry has a high degree of what they call complementarity that's the right word to AI and so that is to basically say this is a this is a work sphere medic medcoms uh, medical affairs where technology will be used not to replace people but to um, assist them uh, in in what they do in terms of efficiency and other things um, with regard to chat GPT, we, we have now built uh, four or five, I can't remember, uh, G- custom GPT tools that I'll talk a little bit about that are designed specifically to be assistants to people in uh, the medical comms arena. And that is to say we've targeted specific functions. So how can we help people uh, benefit from chat GPT or other, other tools? Uh, to improve their workflow, uh, speed things up. Um, so the areas we've looked at are, uh, we have something called Amy, which is AI medical information, which is basically to allow you to pick any piece of information out of uh, drug information, like what is the dose of this drug, et cetera. We've got uh, something called Solara, which is uh, a process of pre- of um, running a, struct, a systematic literature review. So it takes you through things like PICO, Prisma, etc. cetera. And, and I, I found it very helpful as a learning tool. So I didn't know much about uh, literature, literature reviews before. Um, and also we now have something called PACA, which is allows uh, agencies and writers to take copy or adverts or detail aids and compare them to and run them past the code of practice, the UK API code of practice. And it'll give you a sort of summary of where you are and are not complying. And and the final one we've done is for patients. It's a dementia tool. And it's not about, it's about how to cope with somebody in your family or a friend who has dementia. So it's basically a signposting tool. Now, what all these 
have in common is that they are uh, built around the chat GPT model. Um, but we've overcome the three major problems with chat GPT. One, one is reliability. Um, you know, is your information accurate? Are you getting hallucinations? Uh, is the information up to date? The second one is provenance. Where is this information coming from? And can I, can I depend upon it? Um, and finally, security. If I build a tool within my department, how can I not give chat GPT all our information? And the solution to that is something called um, uh, RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation. And that is to say, you don't just send your prompt to chat GPT, you actually get knowledge from within your resources. And so in Amy, it's uh, data sheets. We, we, we created a database of drug information. You ask a question, it goes away, picks that information up, and then just uses chat GPT for the, the language capabilities. So you get a nice dialogue going, but the information you're using, you, you can locate it, you know where it's come from, you can check it, you can see if the thing is, is hallucinating or not, and it's, it's secure. Um, so what we're trying to do here is to focus on developing uh, AI assistance for people that support their, their roles. Um, and helps them build the skills, if you like, of implementing uh, an AI solution without having to go to like the, the you know the C-suite people implementing huge projects. This is, this can be done at a department or even individual level. Um, and as this industry is highly regulated, that makes it all the much easier, to be honest, because we have regulations we can use, we have codes we can use, we have fairly clear pathways of what is what is doable so looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say okay thanks steve thanks um and it's interesting some of the i mean any discussion like this generates the same sort of questions that are starting to pop up already in the chat it's all about confidentiality you know how do you avoid you know um leaking data in with chat gpt or something it's not a confidential environment so um it's important that people understand that yes but there are lots of different ways of going about things now, frankly, where you can ring fence stuff. And for me, that was always the great, you know, the great attraction of this. You look at the amount of data that a drug company has on a on a drug, and you go, how does an individual really know everything about that? Well, if you can ring fence it and use a simple tool to ask questions of it, isn't that a marvelous, marvelous opportunity? And I still think people are struggling with that concept. So, but thanks, Steve, for describing what you're doing there. Um, but leading to Abhishek, so you're in Novartis. Um, I just imagine you've got gazillions of people working away at this stuff. Um, you know, talk a little bit about what you're doing and specifically the confidentiality aspect, because you are very worried about. And, and, and from the point of view of, you know, what do you expect your, your suppliers, your, your, your um, agencies and so on to be doing? And also there's a fundamental question which is going to come up. And we might as well lead into, you know, does a company like Novartis just go, actually with AI tools, we can do it all ourselves. We can write it, produce content. We can do all sorts of stuff. So how worried should the medcoms agencies be or the medical writers about? You see where I'm going. So start with what you're doing, the sort of environment you're and, and start us heading down a couple of direct or a direction like that. See what you we'll can do. Well, we'll do, Peter, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, well, I have to say the first webinar we had last year, um, it created, created a a huge issue in, in so many ways for me because everybody thought I was an expert in, in right. on this topic. And then they were, I started getting these bunch of emails every day saying, can you come and talk? Can you test? Can you try? Uh, but, but I think it was a good initiation because to imagine, if you remember over Christmas, I think you came across what I was dabbling in and creating summaries, text summaries of, of random papers and then rectifying them through what now people fancily call, you know, query engineering or so on and so forth. Um, you know, from, and again, I, I, I'll probably speak from my experience more so and maybe what I've experienced when I look at the landscape within the pharma side, um, you know, rather than just what Novartis is doing. So, you know, from there, from where we were kind of testing out purely it was curiosity, I do see that uh, that perception has evolved from, perhaps to say, this is a fad, it will die, die out soon, to say, okay, maybe we need to take a look at it, to say, oh, okay, this looks interesting. What can we test this out on? 
And I think we are at the phase where we are seeing uh, smaller applications sometimes thinking, okay, this could be a pilot, this could lead to something else. Uh, you mentioned about data confidentiality. I think that definitely is a challenge always. But I think still, you know, when I look at, you know, where we have had even myself, uh, you know, I've tried out uh, with some of some of our partners some plain language summarization. Uh, one of my recent projects with Matt, in fact, and as you know, my my scope now at Novartis uh, is beyond Medcoms. It's in medical affairs. Uh, so uh, I worked with Matt and group to create these. Uh, physician training videos, purely AI generated uh, avatars, and we did it in nine languages, starting from an English base. Um, super efficient, and of course, when we get to that stage, we'll talk about the challenges. Of course, it's not like you feed it in, and it works beautifully, and you finish the project in a week. And I think that is where the human capital comes into play. I haven't heard conversations within uh, the pharma sector where they say we are going to replace people. I think the existing people are finding ways to utilize, you know, what is being available. And every day there's a new version of some, you know, generative AI coming up. There are some specializations. I've seen the Medinfo teams getting quite intrigued by the whole uh, opportunity of creating chatbots, perhaps. I've seen teams, internal teams, uh, getting excited about creating Every, you know, not data lakes, but essentially document lakes of all sorts from where people can dip in, ask questions and get answers to uh, instead of trying to track down the source documents. Uh, I've seen also uh, major use in literature reviews, extraction of uh, text, summarization, trend analysis from insights coming in. In fact, I one of the partners I worked with, we were doing field medical work. Uh, they are using AI to actually kind of improve the quality of insight that's even going in, even before it's going in, so that the trend analysis after the collection is happening gets easier. So I think a lot of these things are are in play. Um, you know, of course, I think the challenge is, do we have a foolproof mechanism to make sure that, you know, the data that we are putting in um, you know, it's not getting used in a in a larger context. You know, how do we make sure that that still stays true to the organization that owns the data? Um, there are setups where you could play within a smaller pool where your data set is used to train, you know, uh, the AI, but it also utilizes external data sets, but it doesn't push your data set into the external data set. So I think those are some of the, I think, offerings that I think makes it a little bit more uh, easier, perhaps, to even try things out. However, I think we are not definitely considering, or anybody I don't think is considering replacing folks. For example, my literature searches, you know, the writers would still do the first bit using some sort of an automation. Or example, even our conference uh, tracking, abstract identification. But then the next step, it does require human involvement. Uh, you know, how do you prioritize? How do you kind of uh, highlight the trends? So, you know, happy to talk about more of those. But I think I think there's, there's, there's that level of, uh, you know, openness to at least try out. And, if, and, and you must have seen uh, recently Trial Assure released 50,000 auto-generated uh, plain language summaries of clinical trial results, which opened a whole different can of worms. And I, I very nicely waded into it saying, oh, look at this remarkable thing. I, of course, I didn't say it was great. I just said it was remarkable uh, because they did it. And they had these loud disclaimers about not using it for as medical advice, you know, having a chat with the physician, et cetera. But it, there, there are, I think, inherent, I would say, risks associated, especially when it comes to health data. You know, uh, people talk about aiding health literacy. They talk about accessibility. But I think from those angles, the safeguards need to be in place. And I think hopefully some of these white papers translate into something more substantial uh, as we work through it. 
Thank you. Um, I do think it's fascinating. I mean, just listening to you, all, all, we've covered an enormous amount of ground already, which we won't have time to go into a lot more detail. And there's a lot of, <laughs> Cathy is doing a lot of work in the chat room, though, answering questions. Um, and I'd like to get down some of the practical practicalities, Cathy, and bring you in as a, as a you know, for medical writers, which is at the heart of, of what we're doing. But before I do that, Avishek, can I just be clear? You sitting where you are in, in a company like Novartis, what, if any, guidance are you now issuing to your medcoms agencies or others about whether they can should shouldn't use ai how do you define it etc so, I, I get the impression certainly some companies are issuing very strict guidance others are going i don't know just get on with it and i just wonder where you are and what your thoughts are in in, in those terms we do have we do have uh, guidelines now for use of AI in general for the employees. And then we take some of that and, you know, for example, if I'm working with an external partner, I would, in fact, you know, inform and educate them about what is our position internally in terms of what, what is allowed, what's the level of transparency, what are the guardrails, you know, what are the potential things that we are not allowed to do, or not supposed to do. Uh, in fact, internally, we do have our own version of ChatGPT, which I try out quite right. frequently, to be honest. Uh, and it and it works. I mean, I see. I ask it this, ask the same question to it every week, and I see if it makes a difference in terms of how it responds. And it 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 has evolved in the last uh, two months or so. So, I think I think we have uh, we we are not being prescriptive per se, but I think the ethical principles still I I would say are quite consistent with what the white papers say, and also internally when I look at it, data privacy, uh, you know, uh, appropriate disclosure. Uh, you know, some of those guardrails, definitely. And and in some cases, it's strictly no-no where we say we don't want to utilize these for some of these aspects, for sure. The other the other point that I've heard discussed, and I don't know whether Novartis has done it or you've done it, um, is that agencies or writers, for instance, have submitted a manuscript and they are finding that their clients and the conversation I remember particularly was in the context of a pharma client, put it through an AI checker went back and said, this is 85% generated by AI, so we're not paying you, sort of thing. I'm simplifying slightly. But to Avishek, I'm asking, again, just specifically, just as an, yeah, any experience of that? Someone like Navarre, do you do that? And then I'm, I'm sort of interested on that particular topic, whether anyone's got any any more experience of that. But that I could get a bit excitable about that. But what's your experience out there in the real world of that sort of question? Uh, people using AI checkers and then how does that influence the discussion sort of thing? Because AI checkers don't work, do they? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, that's a whole different webinar. Uh, but uh, but to, I mean, short answer to the question. So I, I don't systematically check. We don't have a position to systematically check. Uh, and that's why the discussion with the partners is important in terms of the guardrails of what Novartis' standards are in terms of. We, we don't want to be... In a, you know, micromanaging how things are. There's that element of trust that we would like to continue to have, but they are fully aware what our position is and we do it. Out of personal curiosity, for example, sometimes I test things out myself. For example, we received some journal comments uh, recently and I knew the journal was having trouble finding the third reviewer. And then suddenly in a week it all arrived and the, and it was a bit, little bit wishy-washy, the third uh, reviewer's comments. And some of my, you know, some of the folks think hey, this looks like something which is auto-generated. You know, it's like, oh, you need to have a visual, oh, you need to have a paragraph, oh, you need to have this, and and uh, we tried out uh, to see whether indeed it was uh, through AI. Of course, there was no valid way to say it was, but it did feel like it. And, and that's the closest I have been to uh, when it comes to fact-checking whether something's done through AI. Okay, let's let's keep it going. We're going to have to move this conversation on because we're going to run out of time. There's so many things we could talk about here. But thanks, Avisha. Uh, Katja, I'm going to bring you in, and I, I can see you answering questions in the as for the audience and all the rest of it. Let's make it quite specific about the role of the medical writer. Again, one of the things that I'm interested in uh, that's coming out of the freelance survey at the moment is how many of the freelancers are being told by agencies you must not use AI. And again, I'm not quite sure what that means or how that's policed and all this work. Um, but, but again, it's, it reflects the fact that everyone's struggling a little bit to know quite how to use this stuff. Um, Katia, one of the things you're picking up in the, in the, in the chat is um, you shouldn't just produce something out of any of these tools and, 
and publish it as it were okay it needs human intervention and so on one of the points i'm going to challenge you on though is medical writing is a very very broad spectrum of activity okay um and i find it i i i agree with that comment in terms of technical writing and so on and of course i think medical writers are very important and so on but i do know and i've been involved with groups of writers who are at another end of the spectrum which is blogging and wellness and 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 and, and regurgitating frankly content where their businesses are being completely devastated because the ai tools are doing that and then it becomes a question well how far up that spectrum do those ai tools replace people because that's what's literally happening at that end of the spectrum and how and at what point does it become a tool and the good writers use it and so on so i'm just interested in your reflection as a medical writer of of that comment i mean do you disagree with me or do you see that um do you see that activity I definitely see that it, in marketing communication it's a total different ball game this is where those tools are really performant they can really help you you have jasper which is my favorite it just types up blocks with references and so on um Actually, I understand that those people are replaced because you just need one supervisor for everything. Basically, you still have to give the prompt and the topic and you have to have a strategy or content strategy, but the rest can be done by machines and just verified. But in classical medical writing, scientific writing, academic writing and so on, and even regulatory writing, we don't even talk about, but it, it won't replace medical writer, but it will move their responsibility to a more strategic one and a supervisor one. So still you need to do how or know how the systems work and in order to be aware and so on. I also wanted to say something to the AI detection tools. You have to just imagine, and it answers all your questions, that the algorithms which are used for the detection tools are exactly the same like the creation tools. That means also they get it completely wrong. And there have been two studies, which I can quickly um, put in the chat afterwards, which have tested that. And that's not just the only problem with it. So they get it wrong many times, but also the problem is once a reviewer or an editor in classical medical writing publications puts in, in the review process, a paper to have it checked, then it's compromised data integrity is compromised again. It's the same as if a medical writer would put in the paper, which is not published in a review process or in submission process. It is impossible to use them so everybody should be really aware of it so my, my one of my concerns is or one of my the things that i sort of imagine is that in the real world um i mean people actually put up with mediocrity is the way i sort of yeah, describe it right so if you it, it's all very well us talking about technical medical writing and also the importance authenticity voice all sorts of things but actually, if you're sitting in the procurement department and you're you're issue, you know, you're 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 inclined to say, look, if we can do it cheaper and faster and it's okay, then it's all right. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that's coming out from AI tools is very convincing. So, you know, I just I just see a drift, an inevitable drift that way. And I don't know how, I, I think that's a really scary, scary thing. Because we all start to just go, well, the computer says that, so so it must be right. Has anyone got a view on that? Oh, sorry, Kat, you can't. The problem with that is also SEO and Google and search algorithms and organic placement. So you have to have blocks with the right keywords. And that's where those systems work very well because they have keyword search and so on um, integrated. You can adjust the whole text according to new keywords. You can repurpose it. It helps Google to, uh, or for ranking and so on. So companies are forced in marketing to create those blocks, which are not, which may be informative, but, but, but they also already exist a thousand, a hundred thousand times just in the same form. And this is 
more and more content exponentially gets produced and at the end we won't read a thing anymore that's provocative of course it, it, no, but exactly because you just can't can you sort of thing um martin you must be discussing this sort of thing at the end we're working group and you know is, is any of this you know chiming with what you're talking about have you got any views on any of the, what we've just covered i know there's a lot of ground we've just covered there is a lot of ground any, any particular point peter no no just you choose <laughs> what struck you as being uh, particularly uh, troublesome in there, if anything? I, I think uh, you know the, the the main main issue again is is um, wading through the you know, the the large number of tools and new tools being developed and just deciding you know which ones to 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 begin to use just to to educate. Uh, as a medical writer or a medical communicator or anybody involved in science communications because there's so many to choose from um but it it will always come back to the human input and i think that's you know from all of us today that should be the takeaway that there still needs a skilled human being to evaluate whether the the output from the input actually makes sense creates value creates impact and engagement and you know you mentioned you know there are tools there that are you know have huge capability to generate you know hundreds if not thousands of blog posts which we are already seeing across social media that are you know in in many ways just inane not i mean clearly you can just see they're just repetitive and you, we don't want to see that in in our industry we won't see that in industry because you know we are skilled professionals. We will see through that. Um, so I'm going to pick up on that point, though, Martin. So I'm going to, I'm going to butt in. So let's follow this line of thought just for a moment. So one of the arguments um, has been that let's stop worrying about AI tools taking over the role of a writer. Let's acknowledge the fact that there aren't enough writers to do good work and, you know, embrace AI tools to actually just become a lot, lot, lot more productive with the quality stuff. Would you agree with that narrative? Well, I agree with you know, using AI tools as a, a, a ways and means of uh, making medical writers better and doing better work. And yes, being able to to manage you know larger volumes of work because we know there's a paucity of uh, medical writers out there. Um, but you know, the emphasis should be on on upskilling and education around how to to use appropriate tools. And also to to make uh, you know through the work that I've been doing for some agencies, we've been looking at uh, the the difference between enter what I would call enterprise tools, which are you know controlled, private. The terms and conditions of those tools within companies are very clear around privacy and management of intellectual property, whereas the consumer ChatGPT and other tools that we can all sign up to liberally, where um, I would call them external tools. Uh, if you look at the, we never look at the the terms and conditions. The terms and conditions there, you know, clearly state that they can use content which you upload, yeah. not just for their purposes, but to train their uh, their associates and any companies working with them. So you have absolutely no control over that content which you have uploaded. So you know there needs to be care and attention in using these tools that are freely accessible because nothing is free, there's a price to be paid. And I think there needs to be more of an emphasis within, if you're working within companies and agencies and working on behalf of pharma companies to understanding and using enterprise tools, but doing that with you know, levels of governance, guidance, risk management, compliance is, is a real sort of big discussion that I'm having with, with agencies. Okay, it's interesting in the chat. There's, there's some, at least I think there is some discussion going on about translation, for instance. And I have talked to translators a little bit over the last few months, and there's a, a lot of concern about, well, mm. frankly, um, in terms mm. of translation business. And yes. yes, there's arguments about the 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 veracity of the data and so on. But there's an awful lot of excitement about how translation is going to be very different, or is very different, and can be very different. Um, but let's not go down that line. Although there'll be people on the line who are probably interested in that aspect as well. Steve, I'm going to drag you in. Um, as someone who sort of, you know with what you're talking about what you're doing uh working i mean i guess what you're doing simplistically is trying to talk to a farm company and go give us your data put it in this in this ring fenced area and let i mean are you seeing an enthusiasm for that 
just as a principle. Um, are, are pharma companies doing the usual, you know, we're not going to do that until everybody else has done it sort of thing? Or I, I just, I, you know what I'm saying, just try and give us a sense of the enthusiasm, the appetite from pharma for, for doing the sort of thing you're talking about. And what are the concerns, if there are concerns? Well, I, I, I think they, uh, it's still too early, in my opinion, to um, estimate or, or specify what that response is. There's definitely interest. But I think it, that at the moment is overwhelmed by caution. And I think what we have to do, and I, I want to sort of just sort of say to the folks that I don't think that choosing chat GP to generate copy or stuff is, is the right way to go. I mean, we, we've heard all the problems, you know, and those won't go away. What we can do is, as you say, ring fence tools uh, with um, chat GPT now have something called uh, chat GPT teams which has got a price level that is much more acceptable than the enterprise version. And with Teams, you do not lose your data. It doesn't go outside of your, your community. And it's not used to train their models. I mean, they, they're not daft. They know that big companies or even small companies don't want to leak their data into the uh, into the world, especially, especially after people like Samsung got really burnt doing that. So what, I'm, what, I, what we're trying to do is say we can use this uh, retrieval augmented generation model, which uses you, the data you want it to use and only that data, combined with the linguistic capabilities of a generative language model to do a, a, a series of tasks. So we, we, we're out to prove that that can be done. And I say we have four, four models now where the, the systems follow a set of instructions using the data we provide it. So for example, what you could do, and what we have done is say, right, we'll collect all the data we want on this topic, we'll put it into our uh, custom GPT, and then we'll query it. So we're not saying, and we'll pump out, you know, whatever articles or anything. We're saying that is the assistant that we're gonna give people where they can, so you know, literally query anything within that, that, that data set. And if it doesn't know, it tells you it doesn't know. It doesn't just go off and make something up. So I think the answer to your question, Pete, is that when we can start demonstrating that we have a predictable, uh, sorry, a reliable, um, uh, secure uh, and provenance sort of guaranteed set of tools, that people will start using them, especially because we we emphasize that they are suit they are to be supervised at all times they're, they're naughty children we need to keep an eye on all the time and over then we'll see the emergence i think of uh much more capable systems okay again i'm just i'm just i've got one eye on the chat and i think there's a bit of a chat in the moment about you know um uh, using AI detection tools or whatever you know the question is what, why do you need to worry about whether AI is used at all that is probably the wrong well, question. I mean, the simple answer right. is that it, it, it can do things in, in a blink of an eye, really. You know, we can but, we can but do my, a sort of... Um, no, no, no. Sorry, just, just, just to try... And, sorry, I'm just going to stop you there. So the, the question, which I think is coming up in the chat room and which I'm trying to follow, is it doesn't actually matter if AI has been used or not. Because right. the question is, yeah. is, the, yeah. is the output, the content, the whatever, accurate reliable all the you know it does not i mean people there are people and i have arguments with people you know ai is just should be banned you know why should ai be banned you know are you going to ban all the other tools you use on your computer or whatever so i think people come at it or some people come at it from the wrong point of view it's not whether ai is being used that's not the question frankly who cares if what you've got stacks yeah, up as the exactly, right exactly. end product and uh, uh, would everyone agree with that because I, th I feel quite strongly about that i must admit yeah, I, I think agree. the, the uh, sorry, you're Martin Don. Yeah, I was just just uh, I, I was going to agree absolutely, and you know, the follow on there's a, a question in, in the the Q and A from uh, from Tom Grant, which notes that you know any JM New England Journal of Medicine actually supports and encourages the use of AI for authors. So it's actually saying you as authors should be using AI because it recognises the fact that everybody's going to be using it. So there's you know, even 12 months ago, we weren't even, we weren't talking about banning AI because that's just an impossibility. The genie's out of the bottle. It's being yeah. used. So if it's being used, you actually say, 
well use it appropriately and also the journals and the publishers that came together early on last year uh, with the Committee on Publication Ethics as well, but Nature Science, NEGIM came together and said, if you're going to be using these tools, uh, one, they can't be an author, so that's a, you know, uh, a principle, but two, you need to acknowledge their use within the methods or the acknowledgement session, section of the publications to encourage people to say, yes, we are using it and we will be open and transparent about using it as a tool, as any other tool that we may use. Um, so I, th yeah, I think that's the way forward is to encourage use of tools because they're going to be used, but encourage ethical and responsible use of those tools and still judge the output as if that output was produced purely by a human being because that's yeah. how it should I, be. I still, again, on that one, I would be, I would be shaking my head. But, but the logical end point is that you, you end up producing a bit of content and then list every tool that you have used. You know, you don't, you don't list spell check or you don't list that, you know, what, there is something about AI and what does AI mean anyway? And, and, and it's such, I mean, it sounds fine to say, acknowledge the tools, the, the tool you use, but actually, where do you stop? I, I don't know. I just think, I mean, I, I see what we're going through, as a, but I, I would imagine maybe in a year's time, two years time, people are just going to go, look, we're just using tools. I mean, it's just, it's, you know what I mean? I think it's I part of the problem is at the moment, just grappling with the, the ideas, yeah? I, I agree, Peter, but I think the, reac the reaction from the publishers to say, not we're not going to ban it because we would look stupid. We're going to say, yeah. well, acknowledge <laughs> your, its use. And we wouldn't but yes, it will, it, will, it, it will disappear amongst all the other tools that are being used and those tools that have already been using machine learning anyway. So, I mean, it's just ridiculous to... But that, that's how it is. It's, an, it's a knee-jerk reaction, but a, a positive reaction, I think. Peter, if I can Okay, so we've in... got some comments coming from the, oh, the, okay. in the chat room. We do, we do state that we use other tools and things like that. But I, I still think my basic point is, is, is fair, that you know, where do you draw the line? Go on, Avishek, go on. Yeah, I was saying, to answer your question, as a, as a, as a reader, uh, you know, whether or not I care whether what's, what I'm reading, it depends on what I'm reading. And in cases, if it's a blog, if it's, if it's a derivative uh, material where I know it's not the original and it cites the original, I wouldn't mind. But I think in other cases where it's a little bit more serious, you know, for example, where I would like to have that authenticity. So if the disclosure needs to be there for me to, you know, take it with a grain of salt or also to understand that, okay, this might require some level of validation or I need to look for another source to make sure that what they're saying here is correct and accurate. Okay, okay. We're going to run out of time in a minute. And there's so many things. I'm, I'm jotting little things down here. We're not going to have time to do it all. Um, there should just be, I'm hoping that this is just leading to a lot of, in, you know, discussion out there. And maybe there's some argument and maybe people are shouting and throwing things at the screen or whatever. I don't know. But if we think about it and we argue with each other, we'll, we'll move on sort of thing. Uh, we haven't even touched on and I don't propose to, but I'll just acknowledge the fact we haven't touched on graphics and 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 the sort of use of AI tools to do all sorts of you know. Um, there's just amazing things, isn't there, that's being done out there. I want. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna. I'm, I. I don't want to do this, but I'm gonna do this because I think we should finish in a couple of minutes' time. I just wonder. Make it very, very, very practical, okay? And I'm gonna ask each of you. And if you don't want to answer, just go move on. But I'm gonna ask each of you randomly. Just give us maybe a couple of examples of what are you actually doing. In your day-to-day -day life, personally, where it's made a little bit of a difference, I'll, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, having got quite excited a year ago and then spent quite a lot of time messing around, and I signed up to G Chat GPT uh, Plus or Pro, whatever they call it, you know. And after a few months, I realised I wasn't using it, and I just, I don't, I haven't. I've, I've sort of, I'm still fascinated, and I still get a bit excited. But there's not much, if anything, that I do other than a bit of playing from time to time that's oh, actually really God. impacting at a practical level. So, Katia, sorry, what? just give us something that people out there can latch onto and go, well, that's either interesting or not, but it's something practical. Do you see what I'm saying? Katia, I don't know whether you were disagreeing, arguing or or, or commenting on what I just said there. Or the, what it helped me the most at the very beginning was um, citations, citation management. Uh, having copied references from different documents and systems into one place, then you just take it, you put it into ChatGPT and say um, this and this format, and it comes out perfectly um, 
organized according to your prompt, the format, um, the order and so on. So that would be one. Then of course, article highlights, keywords. I also use it sometimes to explain statistics to me because it's all in one place. Um, or to draw me a template for an SOP or for um, a contract. Of course, this is just a starting point. It just gives you a structure and titles. You can use it for alternative title search and, of course, for all your social media or own marketing uh, things. So this okay, is okay. nine examples. Okay, and I've certainly heard a lot of people talk about using it for ideation, you know, so it gets you started or or let's have some different sorts of titles for conference um, presentations or, pay, you know, there, there's a there's a bit of gamification, gamification going on in there, but it gives you a starting point and so on. And we're going to have to be a bit quick about this. Um, um, Martin, I'm going to go to you next. So have you got something that, you know, practical that we can latch onto that as, as a way of finishing? Yeah, I'll just get, just give an example of a tool that I, I have been using for a number of years, which is called Notion, which is a, a scheduling tool. And it has a, an embedded uh, chat GPT version. And um, I mean, similar to Katy, I use that as, uh, I guess, uh, a scaffolding for when I need to prepare big reports, you know, create structures, summarizer tool, um, ideation tool, where I, I'm feeling a little bit uh, stuck around uh uh, a brainstorm my uh, brainstorm process um so i use it as scaffolding and i, I i've sort of referred to that before i found it i find it a useful scaffold but it doesn't replace the text work that i do okay avishek go on have you got something that you can throw in yeah uh, so majorly i would say text summarization because it really helps me uh, i also use a version where it it summarizes and reads out papers to you from pdf which i find very okay. useful uh, the other one, which I really enjoy, is you know checking the readability and then fine tuning it. So that's something that I always uh, find helpful. And the last one, which I've been using quite a bit, is you know simulating a persona, depending on you know what my intended audience is, you know what, you know to kind of ask, interrogate it to say, okay, if you were in you know this person, how would you react if it's this person? Is this something that you would like to do? How would you want to do it like that? So I think that really helps. That's something I've been doing. Okay. All right, I'm I'm very very upset about running out of time, but Steve, I'm going to give you the final comment. What have you very, got to very offer? quickly? Uh, I would recommend any of our attempts at uh, building tools, you know, and we'll be rolling them out shortly. But what I would point folks to is something called Consensus.ai. Um, this is also available in the GPT store, so you can use it uh, via that route. But it's it really is a terrific resource for researching clinical publications um, with summaries and links to them. And it really, I'm hoping we'll be able to put an API into it because it, it, uh, it affects so many areas and really gets right around the problem with Google. So it's consensus.ai. I'll send that out as a, a chat. There we go. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Look, I, 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 I think there's just been a mass of, of little practical tips and, and insights and stuff going on there. We didn't have maybe the argument. I thought, I, I thought we might get a bit more argumentative, but that hasn't happened today. But it's been fascinating listening to you. And I think you probably just shared a lot of useful insight there. And I'm going to sit and watch the recording a bit later on and, 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 and um, hopefully um, contemplate a little bit further. Um, so yes, this will be, this is being recorded. We've got questions coming up in the audience um, and, and hopefully I'm sure it's all perfectly okay. It will be back on Network Pharma TV later on. So um, huge thank you to you guys. There's so much more we could talk about, I know. Um, I'm going to say, I know on your behalf that anybody can contact you. LinkedIn is an easy way of doing so. So please, part of the point is people follow up the conversations and so on. Um, keep the conversations going on social media with hashtag MedComs and all the rest of it. And um, do come back and look at what we're doing in MedComs Networking, um, where there's a lot of, of activity. And for instance, in the next coming weeks and months, we've got a lot of concentration on AI in one guise or another. Um, but I think that's just really interesting. I hopefully there's a lot of food for thought for everybody. And on that note, I'm going to just ask everyone to give us a little wave as I close the recording, ask everyone to look after themselves today. So take care. Bye.